In the last few lectures, we've broken down memory into uh, three main components, and we've delved deeply into the uh, processes involved in each of those components. So first we looked at encoding, and then we looked at storage, and now we're going to look at retrieval, or how we get the information out. We're also going to explore the complex process of forgetting and memory formation, or rather memory creation, where no such memory actually occurs. So Retrieval is basically taking the information from that hard drive, that storage, and putting it onto the monitor or your working memory and using that information. Now, there are two main ways that we can pull information out. Those are recognition and recall. Now, in recognition, this is what you're looking at with a multiple choice test. So oftentimes you might have a, a word on the tip of your tongue but you can't remember it and then as soon as you see that word you're like oh that's what it was. That's a recognition based task. So a perfect example might be if I were to ask someone under 10 what's the capital of France they might struggle with that. But if I showed them these four choices and asked them what's the capital of France then it might click in their mind ah now I remember the capital of France. So recognition-based questions are uh, basically questions that aren't, as in, aren't encoded as deeply. If, if you require recognition to recall the information, then that means that it has a more shallow level of encoding. The next one is recall. And these are going to be your fill-in-the-blank essay questions. So recall is when you have to recall the information using effort. Looking at something might help prime you for that information, but it's something that if you succeed in a recall-based measure of memory, then that means that you have had a deeper level of encoding. So those are the two basic ways that we can bring out the information. We can either recognize it or we can recall it. And we use both really frequently. Now in addition to the ways that we can bring the information out, sometimes we can actually relearn the information. So uh, you know, this is part of why people generally do better when they uh, take a class a second time around. It's not that they necessarily got smarter, it's that they're relearning the information and we see that when you relearn information time is saved for the second time around. It takes you less time to be able to function properly to remember what it is. So in this example right here it might take someone 10 trials to learn this list. However, if you take them back into the session one day later they're probably not going to remember all the words on the list. However, if you show them the list again and give them the opportunity to relearn, it takes only five trials to learn the information. So what we see is that each time that you relearn something, it generally takes about 50% less time to relearn or to learn the second time around than it did to learn the first time. So relearning is part of what makes studying so effective and so valuable. You learn the material in your class, but oftentimes you forget that material. So the more often that you relearn the material, the more likely you are to remember it when it comes time for test day. And this is going to help with that deeper level of encoding that's going to enable recall-based measures. One of the fun ways that you can use um, memory cues is by looking at retrieval cues. So our memories are basically stored in a web of association. Think about your neurons as a neural net where every neuron is connected to a related neuron and these are anchors that can help retrieve memories. So certain retrieval cues can be very valuable for remembering bits of information. Um, or even for identifying bits of information. A perfect example of a cue might be uh, if you were to see a squiggly line in the city, you might think hose. However, if you were to see a similar squiggly line on the ground in the forest, you might think snake.
So retrieval cues are locational or um, you know something that relates to the topic that reminds you of what's going on and they help aid in memory. So a perfect example might be this diagram down here. So a fire truck has many related concepts. It's related to fire, it's related to hose, it's related to truck, and each of those also have related concepts. So what we see is if you activate the image of fire truck, there's actually a cascading level of activation all the way down. So at some level, based on personal experience, you're going to recall or retrieve the information associated with a fire truck quite readily. So I said based on association. If you recall last lecture, we talked about the strengthening of the relationship between neurons, which was called long-term potentiation. Well, that is due to experiential events. So you're not going to strengthen the association between two neurons if you don't use them. So if you've never experienced a fire, then you might be more apt to remember truck and hose than fire when associated with a fire truck. Specifically, you might be more likely to recall red and water than smell, smoke, and heat. Of course you're going to remember fire because that's in the name, but the other three aspects of fire might not come to mind as readily if you've never experienced a fire. So this process is known as priming. So this is when you retrieve a specific memory from this web of association. So if I wanted to prime you to think of, uh, you know, we've got in the English language, we have so many words that are spoken the same, but have vastly different meanings. For example, ball and ball, hair and hair. So priming is what gives us the idea of what is the most appropriate meaning for that given word in the situation. This is how context clues work, because the context primes you and activates the associated concept so that it's easy to determine the true meaning of the word. So if you see the word rabbit, it's going to put a visual image in your mind of a bunny rabbit. Now if someone were to speak the word hair, your automatic association would be with the type of animal known as a hair, not the type of hair on your head. So this process is known as priming, and it's a very rich uh, research area that a lot of people are doing valuable research in. I actually have a, a friend that's going to grad school at Cornell that, that's doing priming research. So priming is a, a very interesting topic, and it relates to the web of association within your brain and how tightly concepts are linked and which ones are activated, which in turn activates the other associated concepts. In addition to this, we have context effects. Now, one of the ways to look at this, we often call this state-dependent learning. So context effects basically mean that when you are in a given context or a given state, it is easy, and you learn the information in that given context or state, it is significantly easier to recall that information if you are in that same context or state. So a perfect example would be something that happens to all of us. How many of you have had an experience where you go to do something in a certain room, and then as soon as you get to that room, gosh darn it, wouldn't you know it, that idea of what you were supposed to do is gone. Now it doesn't just end there. The really sticky, interesting part is that you turn around, you go right back into that room and all of a sudden you remember it again. This is due to the context effects. Basically what's happening is the environment that you encoded that initial information as to what you were supposed to do primes you to remember exactly what it was. This is part of why you should never ever come to class inebriated. The reason being that if you come to class inebriated you're learning the material in a certain state. Come to class to take a test. Well, who's going to come to class drunk or high? Most people won't. 
And what we see is that because you learn the information in one mental state, it's harder to retrieve it in a different mental state. Now, that's not saying that you should, you know, say, oh, well, fuck it, then I'll just come to the test drunk or high. Well, it, it, it's a, that's a bad idea um, because in the end of the day, being inebriated means that you're not going to learn the material as well anyway. Another example, and this is probably my favorite example because it's so salient for many people, relationships. This is a perfect example of what so many men and women complain about about their significant other. How many of you have been in a fight with a significant other and then they drag something up from months ago that you thought was settled, that you didn't even realize was an issue anymore? Well, it's not that your significant other decided to pull out the bitch mode on you and be a complete and total jerk and pull up things that are irrelevant. What's actually happening is that negative thing that they're bringing up was encoded in their mind during a certain context, a context of anger. Now, when they're happy, they're less likely to recall that information because they're not in the appropriate context. However, get in another fight again, and bam, all of a sudden, they're pulling out that contextual information and recalling every single moment that you've ever pissed them off and using it as an arsenal against you. So don't blame your significant other when they do this. Blame their brain because it's something that they have no control over. It's something that their brain is doing automatically by pulling relevant information when it feels it's appropriate. Now we've all had deja vu again. Um, you know, everybody's had some sort of, I've experienced this before, feeling. Well, the reason why we believe this is happening is because there are subconscious cues that we occur, or that occur, that we are unconsciously allowing to trigger the re retrieval of a similar experience. So, uh, you know, you may have this feeling like, didn't I just drive down this road? Well, no, you might have driven down that road a few days ago, and the cues reminded you of it, but glitch in the matrix, right? You don't quite remember the full event, and you wind up with deja vu. Luckily, deja vu isn't something that happens to most people extremely often, because it requires a sufficient level of context clues, or context cues. Without those context cues, without a sufficient level of them, you're not going to have that experience of deja vu. So one of the ways that we can study context effects is by looking at how infants learn. So what we see is that uh, with, with this study, the researchers try to teach infants how to kick a mobile. So they attached a string to the infant's leg and they attached it to a mobile. And of course, babies like watching moving things. They want to touch them and play with them. But they're not able to get up and move around. So this is a perfect opportunity to examine how visual context cues can change the way that an individual learns. So on the left-hand side, we see that the baby is in a patterned crib with squares. And in this situation, the infant learns how to use the kicking motion to get the mobile to work. It doesn't port automatically over for them when they go into a new environment. So we place the exact same baby in a striped crib. Instead of kicking automatically and knowing, oh, hey, that's, that's how this is. I kick, I get the mobile working. Instead of generalizing, they're learning the context that lets them know when it's most appropriate to do that. And right now, the context doesn't tell them to kick, so they have to learn it again. So this goes back to what we were talking about in classical conditioning, when we were talking about how animals and humans can learn to differentiate between specific contexts to know what's the most appropriate behavior. That's what's going on with these context effects. Your brain loves shortcuts. It loves them. Your brain wants to use as many shortcuts as possible because that means that it has to use less glucose, waste fewer resources, and give you more opportunities to do other things. So by using these mental shortcuts and learning which contextual effects allow you to know the most appropriate behavior, 
you save your brain and your body a whole mess of trouble. It's learning that takes a little while, but once it's learned, you don't have to worry about it. Now, this goes back to what I was talking about with significant others. Moods are heavily powerful events that allow you to recall information. They are one of the most powerful contexts that you can have. So, you tend to recall experiences that are consistent with your current move, mood. So this is part of why, when you're really, really sad, listening to a depressing song might not be the best idea. Because what's actually happening here is you're reinforcing that negative feeling with the negative music, and in turn, bringing up even more negative memories. Because you tend to recall more experiences that are consistent with the current mood. So it's really actually a better idea, if you want to get out of a bad mood, to find some way to bring yourself in a positive mood for a brief period of time, because then you can recall more instances where you are in a positive mood. So that's how we pull information out. Oftentimes, though, it doesn't work. It doesn't work as well as we'd like. And when it doesn't work, this is known as forgetting. Forgetting can occur at any of the three primary stages of memory formation. It can occur if we don't encode the information properly or even at all. It can occur if we uh, have problems with storage or uh, memory decay. And it can happen if we just have trouble retrieving the information. So forgetting can occur at any stage of the memory process. Encoding failure is when we can't remember what we didn't encode. So I'm going to reveal what happened in that video a while ago uh, with the, um, you know, with the uh, how many times did the uh, team in white pass the ball. So if you haven't seen that video, which was on intentional resources, pause now, go back to the lecture. I'm sorry, I can't recall exactly which one it is off the top of my head. But look for the lecture that has that video because I don't want to give it away for you, but this is an example of what I'm talking about. Okay, you've had a chance to pause. I'm going to move ahead. So, if we can't remember what we don't encode, that's why when you were watching that video, you couldn't see the moonwalking bear. So, if you're not encoding the information, then if I were to ask you, paused it in the middle and asked you, is there anything unusual that happened in the background of that video, then you would not be able to say yes, because you wouldn't remember. So the external event occurred, and the external events were the two teams passing the ball, but it was also the moonwalking bear. It moves briefly into sensory memory. However, you are only attending to how many passes the team in white makes, because that's what we asked you to do. So your attention pulls out the relevant information and does not encode the irrelevant information. As a result, there's an encoding failure, and you don't recall that information. In addition, we can have some storage decay problems. So what we see is that we have what's known as a forgetting curve. And this is, again, part of why relearning is so important. When you learn material, it rapidly decays. It decays so rapidly that by the end of about the third day, you've lost pretty much everything that you're going to lose. So you're going to remember a certain level of the information, but you're not going to remember it all. So if you merely relearn the information for a while until it gets moved into that long-term memory, then you're going to be better to able to remember the information. So you have to regularly pull stored memories into your working memory and operate on them in some fashion to delay or fight against storage decay. If you just let a memory sit there and you don't do anything with it, well then you're going to have that storage decay. That's part of why we have so much difficulty recalling what happened a few weeks ago. Because unless we practice the information, we're not going to be able to remember it because the retention drops so rapidly. Um, as an interesting aside, 
Uh, you know, a lot of people love talking about um, eidetic memory or, uh, you know, picture-perfect memory or photographic memory. Um, there's a lot of contention surrounding the idea of somebody having perfect memory. Um, and the one of the leading theories in the field is that people that have this eidetic memory are actually experiencing an interesting form of obsessive-compulsive disorder. And their obsession is memory formation, and the compulsion is regularly rehearsing the information. So these individuals, we believe, or at least one of the leading theories posits, that these individuals are regularly rehearsing the information, which is what enables them to remember the information so well. In addition, it's um, arguable, uh, in fact, well supported, that these individuals probably have a relatively large working memory, which enables them to uh, rehearse more information at a given period of time. So this is another example and this is something that we see um, in our own experiences with language. You know, um, I took German in high school. I took German in college. I know my, my cuss words. That's I, I cannot hold an intelligent conversation in German because I just haven't practiced it. And in fact, I'm going to remember the exact same amount of information 50 years from now, for the most part probably, um, than I know now. Because the retention drops so rapidly, but then it levels off. And we see that this occurs with language, with every language, and remains relatively constant for a very long period of time. So in addition to encoding failure and storage decay, we can also have retrieval failure. There are a number of reasons for this, um, and oftentimes these are helped by retrieval cues. So when you have a retrieval failure, oftentimes you get that tip of the tongue phenomenon, where you, you, you know it's, it's there, it's right in the middle of your brain, it's on your tongue, and you can almost say it, but you just can't remember it. So, perfect example, if I were to say, what makes blood cells red? If you didn't know that information, but all I had to say was, it starts with the letter H. Bam! Hemoglobin. Automatically remember it. So that's one of the ways in which cues can help to combat retrieval failure. And the reason why this operates and why this works so well is because of that neural net that I explained. The associations between each of the concepts. So you have a concept for blood. And attached to that concept are a number of other words. For instance, you might have the word nurse, needle, hemoglobin, iron. All of these concepts are directly related to blood cells. However, very few of them are associated with the letter H. Very few of them start with the letter H. You might have multiple associations that begin with the letter H, but in addition, it's tied to the color red. So you have this complex relationship between each of these neurons that connect with one another and have, you know, synaptic operations going on, and when one of them becomes activated, kind of bubbles over and it slightly begins to activate the other and then you get that cue and then BAM! You're ready to go and you remember the information. So what are some ways that can uh, negatively impact your ability to form memories? One of them is interference. And there are two ways of interference. The first way is proactive interference. So a perfect example might be if you were to learn French or study French and then study Spanish. The French would proactively interfere with the Spanish. So always remember that proactive interference means that what happens before inhibits the ability to encode what happens after. As a result, this student might perform more poorly on the Spanish exam because of the impact of the French. On the other direction is retroactive interference. So again, same student studying French and then she studies Spanish. 
And then she goes to take her French midterm. So she experiences the retroactive effect where the Spanish negatively impacts her ability to recall the French. So interference is something that you have to be careful of. And one of the reasons why it's good to switch it up with topics that are uh, less related, um, but also to tie the concepts together that are related so that you can build a deeper, more involved neural network and give yourself more retrieval cues. One of the best pieces of advice that I can give you for studying is examples. In your mind, you should always come up with at least three examples of a difficult concept. Because when you do that, then you have the difficult concept, but you also have the connection to each of those three different examples. So if you only remember one of those examples really well, it primes you and then you're able, better able to remember the full concept. And then in addition to being better able to remember the full concept, that primes the rest of it, it cascades down, and it actually activates those other examples. And that gives you a better understanding of the material. So it's great to relate information to your own personal experiences because those are already deeply encoded in your mind. Those are your memories. Those are personal and they're more likely to be remembered than information on the page. So find a practical application for almost any subject. You can do this with chemistry. You can sit there and think, okay, I'm chewing and you know talk about what chemicals are going on in your stomach that are breaking down the material but if you put it in that that framework then you're better able to recall the information so this is a graph that sort of displays the impact of retro retroactive interference and this is one of the reasons why sleep is so valuable because sleep helps to consolidate memories Sleep is very complex. We don't fully understand exactly why we need it, but we know some of the benefits. And one of the benefits is that when you sleep, you are better able to recall the information. You know, um, I, I, I didn't do a lot of studying in college, largely because I, I took advantage of my knowledge of how memory operates, and I used that information to prepare me for it. But in addition, I slept. I only pulled one all-nighter in college. Don't do it, guys. Don't pull all-nighters. It's not going to help you. If you remain awake, then you're not going to remember the information. All-nighters are more appropriate for writing papers than they are for taking tests. The best thing you can do to, before taking a test is get a good night's sleep. So this visual sort of shows you just how profound that effect is. You're gonna If you uh, learned nonsense syllables, and you went to sleep, when you woke up, you would remember about 55% of those. That's pretty good. If you uh, stay up for eight hours, instead of going to sleep for eight hours, yeah, you're only gonna remember about 15%. That's, that's not good at all. So, sleep, guys, it's really important. It helps with consolidating memories, and it's gonna make you a better student. It's gonna make you better able to present when you're in the workforce. You need your sleep, it's very important. So this is a contentious area here. Uh, this is motivated forgetting. So we talked about accidental forgetting, things that nobody really wants to do, you know, not properly encoding the information, uh, you know, not being able to retrieve it because you've got a tip of the tongue. But what if something was so horrible that you wanted to forget it and you tried to repress it? So Sigmund Freud was a champion of this idea of motivated forgetting. That people want to forget the information. They don't actively forget it. They unknowingly revise their memories in such a way that it jives with what makes them feel better. So they use repression, which is this defense mechanism that gets rid of the anxiety of the negative memory. And it removes it from your memory. The problem with this is that issue of emotion. And we've already spoken about this. I'm, I'm not going to get too, too in-depth with it again because we, we've touched on this a number of times. It's difficult to buy into repression because emotional memories are so deeply ingrained in our memory formation 
because they are important to our survival. The only time this is not true, the only time where emotions lead to poorer memories, is when you are under extreme levels of stress for an elongated period of time. As such, if you were, say, sexually abused, you would have maybe not a memory of every abuse, but you would know that you were abused. If it was a single instance of abuse, you can damn sure bet you're going to remember it, unless you were under the influence of some sort of drug that inhibited your ability to encode the information properly. So, the way that we can think about why we forget information is by thinking about the amount of content within any memory. So, sensory memory, as we said last time, is unlimited in capacity. And the fact of the matter is that there are so many bits of information going on at any given time. Right now, my brain is processing the fact that I've got a fish tank behind me that's bubbling. My brain is also processing the fact that I forgot to shut off my kitchen light and that my cat is sitting to the left of me looking out the window. So all of this sensory memory is huge and it all comes in. However, I'm not actively attending to all of the pieces of information. So for example, how many of you, I'm sure you've all read this where it's like, you know, you are now aware that you are you know, consciously breathing and, uh, you know, that your tongue is heavy or that your fingers are touching. Well, all that information is already there in your sensory memory, but your short-term memory isn't normally attending to that. So very few pieces of sensory memory are actually attended to, only the relevant information. So you take all those bits of information and you pare it down. Now you're going to pare it down even further because you filter the information. You determine what needs to stick in your long-term storage. I don't need to remember my phone number from when I was a little kid. That's gone. I have no idea what it is. I just don't. I remember the one from when I was a teenager, but I don't remember the one from when I was a little kid. So part of the reason why I don't remember it is because I haven't practiced it. So it moves down another level where we've got the retrieval from the long-term memory where even less information might come out, largely due to memory effects like interference, both retroactive and proactive, insufficient cues. Moods might inhibit it, motivations. So some things are going to get readily recalled really easily and other things aren't. In addition to that, we have um, a lot of problems with misinformation and imagination. Um, in fact, certain words can prime you to have a memory of an event in a different light than the way that it actually occurred. So do this little experiment. Think about a memory that you have that's significant to you, but maybe not as significant to a sibling. Now go speak with that sibling if you have a sibling, if not, speak with a parent, and ask them their version of the story. And what you'll see is that they probably conflict. And the reason why is because we have imagination effects. We consolidate the information that makes the most sense to us based on the contextual cues and the information that we know about who we are. So this is a perfect example, a depiction of an accident between two vehicles. So you can see that the blue car ran into the red car. Now, if I were to ask Group A, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? And ask Group B, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? What do you think might be the effect on their memory of the event? Well, we see that individuals in Group B believed that there was more broken glass than those in Group A. In fact, significantly more. So only about 14% in Group A said that there was broken glass, whereas 32% in Group B said that there was, and remember Group B was told they were smashed into. In addition, 
they believe that more damage was done to the car. So let me go back to the original incident, and you can see that there's no damage to the hood whatsoever on the red car. There's minimal damage to the blue car's hood, but you go over to this picture, and that's what they recall. They recall a more significant level of damage. Memory construction is part of what makes it so difficult to take witness statements. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was a witness to an event, and I was aware of this phenomenon, so I, I did my best to counter it. Um, I was uh, a witness of an event. I worked at a, 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 you know, an arcade called Celebration Station, and um, you know, I was walking around the game floor because that's what I did. I was a game coach. I fixed video games, and um, you know, there was this, uh, you know, these two guys that were on the, um, you know, the little rowing machine where you like paddle down a river, and sure enough. A gun falls out of one of their pockets. What? A gun? In a family fun center where there are children running around? So I, I freaked out. I didn't pay a lot of attention as to what the guy looked like or anything like that. And I went and I told my boss immediately. I said, Tony, there's a man with a gun in the store. And he flipped out. He called the cops. You know, he ran around like a chicken with his head cut off. And he wanted me to identify the individual. I couldn't do it. I mean, I, I remembered that he had on gray sweatpants. That's all I remembered. I didn't remember anything else. So when the officer came to speak with me, he wound up asking me leading questions. Questions that might lead someone to form false memories. So he asked me questions like, did he look like a gangbanger? I have no idea. Well, did he have a pant one pant leg rolled up? Again, I have no idea. However, had I been unaware of the way that memory construction operates, I might have said, you know, yeah, yeah, I think he did have a pant leg rolled up. I think you're right. So that's one of the dangers of leading questions when reporting and dealing with witnesses to crimes. It's part of why it's so important to have police officers well trained on appropriate interviewing techniques, because otherwise, we see with our very imperfect judicial system that many people get sent to jail for crimes that they didn't commit because of false memories of the witnesses and because of leading questions by the officers. So, one of the things, you know, I talk about false memories and everything like that, right? Some adults do forget childhood episodes of abuse, but for the most part, if it's a heavily emotionally charged incident, they won't. If it's singular, they probably won't. Especially if it was singular and emotionally charged. If it's prolonged, sure, they're probably going to forget specific instances. But beyond that, you can actually have false memory syndrome, which is a condition in which your identity and relationships are false. You believe in a memory of a traumatic experience, but it never really happened. This is part of the danger of, um, you know, supposed therapists. Sometimes there are, like, actual therapists that, that accidentally do this, but, like, you know, those, uh, you know, psychics do this all the time. This is part of the danger of going to see a psychic, because they can implant memories. You know, they can, you know, this is why we, hypnotism is, is dangerous as well, because you implant memories that didn't actually occur, and as a result, you can have the belief that a traumatic experience happened to you that never actually happened, and that can change your outlook on life. So, this is a perfect example of why we need positive, high-quality interrogation techniques, especially dealing with children. Children can sometimes be even more unreliable than adults, especially if leading questions are posed, because they want to work well with the person that's interviewing them, they want to make sure that they do a good job, so you have to make sure that the interview content is neutrally worded, because otherwise, if you have something that's positively or negatively charged, you may have implanted a memory into that child. In fact, we see that when we use neutrally worded questions, there's a lower percentage of reported sexual abuse. So if you were to ask a leading question like, um, you know, 
Did he touch you below the waistline? Well, you know what? He tickled me on my knees. I'm going to answer yes. Instead, if you were to ask, have you been touched in an inappropriate area? That might change the child's response. So using neutrally worded questions is the best way to go about getting an accurate recall or a more accurate recall of the information. It's not going to be perfect because again you're consolidating it with the information that you already know about yourself and the world. I'm just gonna leave this up here because we've already touched on this really heavily. I meant to take out this slide. We know that uh, most most psychologists believe that memories may be constructed or that these memories um, you know aren't actually repressed. <clears throat> and that when you pull out the repressed memories, then it's constructed. So I told you guys last lecture that I was going to post a video from Elizabeth Loftus. Well, I decided not to because I figured it was actually more appropriate here, and I'm going to post this on Reddit. I want you guys to watch this because it is crazy awesome. So what she did was she implanted the memory of being kidnapped, or actually almost being kidnapped, being lost at the mall and almost being kidnapped into people's minds. All it took was to tell them that it had happened. I, I mean, it, it was nothing significant. It wasn't anything huge. They just had to say, yeah, this is what we, we spoke with your family. This is what they said. They said that you were lost at the mall and that um, they, they believe that someone tried to kidnap you. All of a sudden, you start pulling together information that you know about kidnappings and information related to what you've been told by the researcher uh, that your family had told them, right? and you wind up creating a memory. It's not your fault, it's the way that your brain operates. So, <clears throat> if it's really easy to forget stuff, and it's surprisingly easy to make up stuff, how can we improve the memory? The key thing that you need to do is relearn, not studying. Study repeatedly. Don't just do it once, study again and again. Spend the time rehearsing or actively thinking about the material. This is how I studied. Number two is how I studied when I was in college. I didn't sit down and do long night sessions. Instead, I thought regularly about how the material related. So I might be in history, and I would think <clears throat> about a certain leader, and I'd be like, you know what? He has behavioral characteristics similar to this psychological disorder. So that's a way of actively thinking about the material in every situation. <coughs> in addition to making it relevant to stuff that you know by rehearsing or thinking about it, you should also make the material personally meaningful. Because when it comes down to it, the thing that you care most about in the whole world is yourself, your life, and the people you know. So if you relate the material to yourself, your life, and the people you know, then it becomes personally meaningful, and it then becomes attached via synaptic connections to your knowledge of that specific event, individual, or concept. It's very powerful to make it personally meaningful. Lastly, tricks. Use mnemonic devices. So if you remember, uh, we talked about uh, the linking method, we talked about the method of loci, uh, we talked about the chunking method. All of these are very effective mnemonic devices which enable you to remember the information. So, uh, you know, PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Everybody remembers that because it's something that is already stored in your information. You already know all the words that make up PEMDAS. And then all of a sudden, you can remember, okay, it's parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, and then you move on to addition and subtraction. So you remember that due to the mnemonic devices that you've, you've used. So improving memory, this is what you can do to improve it. In addition, you want to activate those retrieval cues. If possible, you should try to take the test in the same environment that you learn the information. It's a nice method to uh, possibly make your study environment similar to your test-taking environment. 
An opposite way of approaching this is to have multiple retrieval cues. So what I mean by that is if you know that your test is going to be in a different room than where you learn the information, what might be better for you to do is instead of studying in the same environment that you le learn the information, study in multiple environments. By doing that, you give yourself multiple retrieval cues that all work together to give you better access to the information. It's also best to study relatively soon after you learn the information. Don't wait a week. Don't wait until the day before the test. Otherwise, you're going to encounter misinformation. You're going to pull the information from unrelated topics and it's going to melt together and you're going to give a really shitty response. So recall the information while it's fresh and recall it often. Lastly, minimize that interference. Know when you are interfering yourself. Know when you're making it worse for you. So test your knowledge. You know, do quizzes. Uh, you know, go through the questions in the back of your book and make sure that you can answer them to your satisfaction. In addition, figure out what you don't know and work on that. You know, I, uh, I'm applying for PhD programs at the moment, and uh, I just took the GRE. Uh, you know, I took it on, on Tuesday, actually. I took it right before I recorded Tuesday's lecture. And um, I got to tell you, I, I studied my ass off for it. And what I found was, uh, you know, when, when I studied, I, I was always getting the same types of questions wrong on the math. Exponents and roots. I'll tell you why. I didn't rehearse that information when I was in Algebra 2. I didn't do well in Algebra 2. My family was going through a really hard time. I didn't encode the information properly. It's not in my memory bank. But, to counter that, that's what I studied. I really focused on exponents and roots. Because you determine what you don't know, and you rehearse that. Certainly rehearse what you already know, but really focus on what you don't know yet. And it's a good idea to link what you don't know to what you already do know. That way you get a more complex net that works together to make it easier for you to retrieve the information. So that's it. We really wanted to talk about memory formation, and we've done that. We've learned about how memory gets in, how it is encoded into your mind. And then we talked a little bit about, you know, what happens with the storage part. And then we talked about actually pulling that information from long-term storage and using it in that short-term storage. Lastly, we really focused on uh, forgetting, why forgetting happens, and how we can combat it. So if you have any questions uh, about any study tips or any advice that you might want about how to better recall information, give me a shout. I'll be more than happy to help you. So until next time, thanks for stopping by. We'll talk to you later.